The year is 1645. You're an English peasant and you're permanently scared because there's a monster in your town giving you goats infections and probably having sexual relations with the devil. And this monster, horrifyingly, is a girl monster. The same fear has gripped Scotland and a lot of Europe, and soon it'll be spreading to America. In fact, by 1750, 40,000 of these accused witches will have been executed, tortured, hanged, and burned at the stake in the name of civil society. Of course, nowadays we know that witches aren't dangerous. They're just lonely teenagers with TikTok accounts. And historians have a lot of explanations for why such a dumb superstition incited so much murder. Everything from religious differences to mouldy, hallucination-inducing bread. But some academics have a different theory. They point to the fact that the vast majority of witch trial victims were women. Pretty direct quotes from legal officials. And the fact that accusations of witchcraft were routinely used to punish local women, especially those who deviated from social norms. The old lady that was rude to you, witch. You've been sexually rejected by a woman, she's probably a witch. Your wife shouted at you, shout no more, hag. So this folklore, early modern history's most prominent supernatural monster, might have been hiding something else. Intertwined with this fear of witches was a hatred of women. Now let's skip forward a bit. You're a literate Victorian, go you. And you've spent the better part of a century enjoying a new kind of monster. Now you don't actually believe in the existence of blood-sucking undead beasts. In 1700s Eastern Europe, people really did. And that was fair enough. Without understanding the process of decomposition, groaning, farting corpses with growing hair and nails could easily be mistaken for demonic entities. But here in 1897 England, you're just enjoying your horror stories. And Irish author Bram Stoker has just published a new novel that's going to cement 1800s gothic fiction as the century of the vampire. You see, the corpse-like creature of vampire folklore has been modernised. Victorian vampires like Dracula are sultry, well-dressed perverts with a thing for English girls. And perhaps that's why they're so popular. Many critics argue that vampire novels were really about the corruption of English womanhood. In this strictly religious and sexually restricted culture, a book like Dracula was pretty obscene. Extramarital relations, foreign men penetrating English women with their teeth, allusions to homosexuality, sexually dominant women, there was, there was a lot going on. You see, vampires tapped into deeper fears of the time, of sexual deviance, of London's new wave of immigrants and their genitals, of decent Christians replacing the Bible with books where impregnation actually involves intercourse. But perhaps the popularity of vampires also revealed that same society's burgeoning sexuality. Perhaps you'll delight in Dracula's transgressiveness. Though many Victorians would have found vampires terrifying, it's likely that many also found them erotic. After all, many historians believe that Bram Stoker himself was a closeted gay, based on some pretty intense letters to male companions and his close friendship with Oscar Wilde, who'd just been put in the can for being not so closeted. So the semi-erotic relationship between Count Dracula and the novel's protagonist might have been less of a warning and more of a, ooh, wouldn't that be fun? Vampires then perhaps reflect a cultural paradox of stiff morality and sexual obsession. The vampire contains Victorian society's fear and fascination of sex. And all the way through history, the pattern continues. Consider the post-book era of 1950s America with a wave of alien invasion movies. Iconic sci-fi horror films like Invasion of the Body Snatchers and It Came From Outer Space depict small American towns being set upon by alien forces, where citizens are abducted and replaced with extraterrestrial clones. And the popularity of alien films spoke to an America that was hysterically terrified of communism and the Soviet Union, of an ideological subversion of American values of decent-hearted suburbanites reading Karl Marx and getting big ideas. Aliens, foreign, unknowable and dangerous, were a perfect reflection of the Red Scare. Around a decade later, the Canadian-American filmmaker George A. Romero would kick off the now pitiful zombie craze with the horror classic Night of the Living Dead. 
This monster was once a part of Haitian mythology, a corpse voodooed back to life, but it found new resonance against the backdrop of the Vietnam War and racial politics. American homes had been exposed to the first televised war, graphic footage of violence and bloodshed that brought the conflict close to home. And domestically, the civil rights movement and racial violence were exposing a divided society. So Night of the Living Dead, with its handheld documentary-style depictions of brutality, presented hordes of monsters that looked a lot like us, and seemed to show humanity's capacity for collective aggression. In the flesh-eating undead was a very American fear of war and violence. Of course, zombies haven't exactly had their day, and perhaps there's a good reason they still get pumped out so often. 9-11 was an enormously symbolic attack on the heart of the Western world, and it left quite the psychological mark around the globe. In the years to follow, the threat of terrorism and the fear of societal breakdown, along with hideously inflated Hollywood budgets, allowed for films where the government loses control, where law and order could no longer protect the average citizen. But these films weren't all about brain eaters. It could be a giant sea creature, or alien robots, or cold weather. The monster no longer mattered, so long as there was a general threat of death in your own home. So where does this leave us? Where's the monster of the present? Recent horror villains have made us tense about grief, the devil and STDs, but it's hard to identify a monster as iconic or imbued with as much contemporary meaning as the ones of old. And yet as a society, we seem to be collectively more scared than ever. Three quarters of young people across the globe are frightened for their future, and diagnoses of anxiety have tripled since 2008. According to American sociologist Barry Glasner, we are living in the most fear-mongering time in human history. And yet in many ways, things seem to be pretty decent. Global poverty is declining, medicine's better, we're living for longer, and most people across the world are far less likely than ever to be murdered. But we're also exposed to more looming threats. Financial crashes, political corruption, nuclear war, and of course, the slow, painful death of that spinning rock we live on. They say that every generation thinks it's the end of the world, but with leading scientists anticipating climate catastrophe, the fresh memory of history's most boring pandemic, and the doomsday clock closer than ever to midnight, it feels like our apocalypse sizing has a little more empirical weight behind it. And yet in popular culture there's no distinctive climate change monster, no Covid creature, no universal symbol of our terror. And maybe that's because we're all frightened in different ways. You see, our fears seem to arise from the information we consume, but between increasingly polarised news broadcasters and the wacky old world of social media, people are scared of radically different things. In the 2022 Chapman University survey of American fears, nuclear war and economic collapse both ranked below the top fear, corrupt government officials, and it's safe to assume those surveyed were referring to contradictory people. Fear of terrorist attacks ranked, rather interestingly, right next to fear of government restrictions on firearms. Deep lakes and oceans and sharks sandwich dying. Studies have shown that in the UK young people are scared of their future but also that older people are scared of younger people. And among all this politicised fear the classic monsters are still invoked from different angles. A Michigan Republican labelled top Democrat women witches. The Atlantic called Boris Johnson's cohort zombie populists. Pockets of confused Americans believe that politicians drink the blood of children to preserve their youth. And the words illegal aliens still get thrown about in reference to immigration. We might be more scared than ever, but in today's global digitised world, our fears are less shared, more eclectic and sometimes entirely antithetical, and they're fed by our constant access to grimness. An experiment at McGill University in Canada showed that when exposed to news, we're more likely to seek out content that's depressing and frightening. We've got really good at consciously making ourselves scared and angry. It's the doom scrolling Olympics and everyone's playing. So, and you'll have to forgive this incredibly lame sentence, perhaps today's monster is fear itself, a faceless entity too multifarious to be embodied in a single wacky organism. We're certainly living in a strange world. Statistics tell us we're mostly safer and happier than ever, and yet we're constantly spinning out over impalpable threats. There's many reasons we enjoy horror, the psychological arousal of fear and subsequent relief, the social value of being scared of the same thing. Sometimes we just need a villain to make us feel better about ourselves, but it's hard to pin down a defining monster in the mental circus of fear we're currently occupying, and it seems like we're overexposed to a constant sensation of dread, unable to distinguish between genuine and sensationalised threats, terrified about just how impending and monstrous our designated dangers really are. At the very least, with some concerted effort, we can try to enjoy the horror show.